my name is Jackson. I work uh, as an engineer for Slack. And um, so I like to say, uh, no data, no problem. If you got no data, you got no problems to solve. Yeah. Hey, um, my name is Alan. Um, I work as a monitoring infrastructure team along with Jackson. Uh, yeah, no data is no problem, but unfortunately, that is not the way the real world works. And often, you end up with a lot of partial data, and that is the cause of most of the problem, and that's how we employed. And our talk is also about how are you going to solve those partial problems throughout the talk. So first we'll start off talking a little bit about Slack. Uh, we had a public launch in 2014, uh, and we have 1,500 employees across 10 offices in seven countries. Uh, and we target a diverse set of industries. Um, we target, like, obviously, the technology industry, but also media and retail, um, telecoms, and professional services. Uh, we have about 10 million uh, daily active users and uh, 85,000 paying customers. Uh, of the Fortune uh, 100 companies, 65 of those are customers. And we're in 150 different countries with uh, 15,000 apps in our app directory. So we're here to talk about events and event pipelines. Uh, so we'll start off talking about uh, what an event is. And you can think of an event as like a single occurrence within an environment, usually involving an attempted state change. Uh, and this can be something like an uh, incoming HTTP request or a cache lookup. And usually we associate these with uh, some time and um, usually some effect from the state or some cause for that uh, state change. And we can collect these uh, events into logs. And so in the case of like an HTTP request, the log would look like you have your client IP address, you may have your request path, um, and all of that is what makes up the HTTP request. And we use these logs to answer our uh, critical business questions. We can say, okay, what went wrong? Why did these things go wrong? And we also have a notion of log producers and log consumers. So log producers naturally are the things that produce the logs, and log consumers are the uh, things that consume the logs. And people and machines can both be log producers and log consumers, and a lot of times they're doing this at the same time. So. Um, in, or we often see that like a single log or a single log event can be used to uh, answer many different questions in different contexts. And so we use this data uh, to get an understanding of our, the current state of our systems uh, and our services. And once we get a good understanding of the current state, we can use this to uh, and have better informed actions on the next steps we want to take or uh, better informed understanding of where the uh, service might be headed. So uh, to give a little info about logging at Slack, we have about uh, 3 million events per second at our peak ingestion, uh, and we queue those events onto four individual Kafka clusters. And uh, at our peak, we're processing about 3 terabytes of data per hour. So I want to give an example of how we use uh, some of the logs at Slack. We do the uh, fair billing policy, which means that we only bill users when they come online. Um, and so it's very important for us to capture when a user becomes active in a Slack team, uh, because if we can't do that, then we can't accurately bill. And we also use uh, our logs to measure our service quality. It's Slack's mission to make, to make work life productive and pleasant. And in order to do this, we need to make sure that Slack is a reliable service. It should be available whenever and wherever our users need it. And so we can use these logs and metrics to measure the availability and status of our service. So here I'm showing a picture of uh, our, basically where we started with our logging infrastructure. We had, a, uh, we had our application, it would write to two services, our syslog and one called Bruce. And what Bruce would do, it was it take data in a binary protocol and write it directly to Kafka. From there, we had a service called Secor that would take the data, um, pack it in hourly buckets and write that to S3. Once it's in S3, it's ready for our data warehouse to ingest. But we also had to deal with uh, system logs and text logs. 
So those go through, go through our, our syslog path. Our syslog writes the data to our Elasticsearch cluster. Elasticsearch would take the syslog, or take the text logs, parse them with regex or grok patterns, uh, format them into a kind of semi-structured uh, document and write that to Elasticsearch, which we use for log search. Uh, occasionally we would find that we need some text logs in our data warehouse, so we have like our syslog writing into Kafka and then through Secor and then into S3. A and so it, you kind of get like this complex map of pipelines going on. And the big problem is, is it reliable? So first we had two different logging pipelines here and it caused a big maintenance headache. Uh, we didn't know if we lost any data during transit. Uh, if there was an outage, we didn't know how much data we lost. You know, if we have like a 10 minute outage on our, on Bruce or if Kafka goes down, we have no idea if we lost you know, three terabytes of data or we were able to recover all the data. And we didn't know uh, if our logging pipeline was secure. We didn't have room for secure protocols in our pipeline. And when it comes to billing data, that becomes very important. And we also knew uh, Bruce worked well, but it was a black box for us, and we didn't really understand how it worked internally. So we decided to start new and build a new logging pipeline. And we wanted to identify uh, what's important in this pipeline. So we came up with four characteristics, the first being trust in logs. We wanted to make sure that our developers can use our log pipeline and be confident that their log events are going to make it into the database and that they can uh, query this database and be able to use the results from the logs. And, and you know, on top of that, some of the critical uh, pipelines in our infrastructure rely on our logging pipeline. So it's not good enough to say, oh, we had an outage and we lost data. When we lose data, we want to be able to say, uh, this is how much data we missed. Uh, this is where we lost the data, and this is the time uh, window where we were losing data. These together would allow us to minimize the impact of data loss. Naturally, you also want a high availability uh, in your event pipeline. So for those, that means we'll use fault tolerant protocols. And we want the system to automatically retry on failures. And uh, finally, we want to make sure that we can ingest logs when our uh, parts of the logging infrastructure are offline. So as I showed before, we uh, ingest logs into Kafka for Q, but what happens when Kafka goes offline? We want to make sure that we can still ingest logs and from the log producer side, uh, nothing has changed. So next we need low latency. Low latency is very important because uh, we decided that the time to insight should be in milliseconds. Our critical systems depend on these metrics, so we need to be able to uh, you know, have the latest data so we can respond accordingly. And most importantly, we know that the value of data exponentially decreases as time moves on. And finally, we need an efficient system. We want minimum computation and storage uh, as far as resource usage is concerned, and we want the system to run with minimal operational overhead. And then on top of that, we're tenants of business systems, so we don't want to spend too many uh, host resources on ingesting logs. And finally, we realize that when we're emitting some of these log events, uh, we're sending them through multiple pipelines, like basically the same data through multiple pipelines to get into different endpoints. And so we wanted to leverage Kafka's uh, consumer framework so that we can send the data once to Kafka and then have consumers ingest it as they need it. Yeah. Thank you, Jackson. So as Jackson mentioned, just to recap, like we took a step back and see like what it really mean to build a data pipeline for us. So we wanted to have a trust in logs, low latency, high available, efficient system. Um, but how do you do that? Um, so in order to build a trust in data, um, we need to capture a lot of metadata information around when it is originated, who originated the event, how it is getting transformed across the pipeline. Um, we cannot expect um, our application developers or the log producers to give us all the metadata information. So what we come up, we created a protocol called Maroon Protocol 
So Merlin protocol is essentially a set of metadata fields. Uh, it's a protocol format. So any application developers or any system logs, they wanted to ship logs to our pipeline, essentially use the protocol to package their logs and send that one, right? Um, so we have this following fields. Um, timestamp is a, a Unix timestamp. It essentially says like when the event is originated, right? And the host is essentially what is the host that generated the log and uh, type. Um, it essentially says the type of the log. Let's say an example of Apache access is like an access log. Um, there might be a Kubernetes logs or like a different application system generate different types of logs. Um, so type essentially says who owns the data, like who is the producer of the data. Um, in, in a single host, there will be multiple application can run. So the type distinguishes who is the actual owner of this uh, log. Um, and the offset, a offset is a very important property here. Offset is an incremental sequence number um, generator for type. So when, a, when an application write events to our event pipeline, we generate um, an incremental sequence number if for each and every type. Um, so we do this for a reason because downstream in anywhere in our event pipeline, we can essentially reconstruct the whole uh, events and we can see where is a missing sequence and we can reliably say where we missed the data here, right? Um, and then the PID is a process ID because process can always die and can restart. When it is restarted, it can reset the offset. So we wanted to make sure the offset and the PID combine the unique identification of this incremental sequence number. Um, then there's a message. Message is the actual payload. It could be an Apache access log or any business metrics that people send. Um, and the signature. Um, Jackson talked about like how Slack uses the logs to power billing stats and the metrics. Um, it is very, those are the metrics actually get reported to the Wall Street. So we don't want, we wanted to be make sure that none of the system in the middle can tamper the business metrics. Um, so we implemented a signature feature is essential uh, to provide this functionality. Um, and finally, there is a tax. Tax is just a key value pair. Um, we added this because we noticed that some of the application, like let's say some applications runs on Kubernetes, they wanted to add more metadata information, like what kind of a container image they're running in, uh, what is the cube image they're running in, is there any con container version they added that. So they can add all those other related relevant metadata information along with the payload, not necessarily directly correlated with the application, but those infrastructure met uh, metadata information might be useful for some consumers downstream. So the MERN protocol, essentially a very flexible way to enforce certain standard. How do we ship our logs into our pipeline? Um, so take a deep dive on this. So you can see the timestamp, host, type, uh, offset, and PID, all those five dimensions, if you take, that is a unique identification of an event. You can globally identify a particular event when, when it is generated. So you can, uh, the, the, the important property of this UID, you can reconstruct the whole uh, pipe, uh, whole event generation at any point of a time, and you can replay and understand how does the transformation happen, uh, what is happening through the event pipeline. So that's how we build um, trust in the logs. What we say essentially, it is literally impossible to build a pipeline that will not lose any data. We, we are not guaranteeing like 100% reliability, but what we're guaranteeing is that if you lose, if you lost any data in the, in, the, in, the, in the middle, we can give you a high visibility and we can give you what percentage and when and where we lost the event. So when the producers or the consumers trying to make a business critical decision, they can make with appropriate confidence um, based on our metrics. Um, so the message and signature, I talked about the business critical metrics. Uh, so what is, what is happening here, the producers use a HMAC uh, signature, like let's suddenly do a HMAC uh, encryption on the message, create a signature, and add the signature along with the payload. So in the downstream pipeline, before we put those data into data warehouse, we create the same HMAC signature and validate whether the signature matches or not. 
if the signature doesn't match us, we can assume that something happened in the middle, some alteration happened, we drop those message. We will not end up in the data warehouse, so that we don't build twice or we don't do a pulse building on top of it. Um, so that's essentially a rough design of modern protocol. Um, the protocol is nice, but it is still a very conceptual design, right? We still need to build a high available low latency system on top of the modern protocol uh, in order to really build this even pipeline. Um, so we started working on, on the infrastructure part of it, right? Uh, so this is, we started the concept of event sourcing as a service. So this is, this components essentially provide like an event sourcing as a service. So three components are important in this, um, in this design. Uh, one is like Maroon agent, uh, and Maroon server and event queue. So we use Kafka as an event queue, uh, but I'm not going to talk about much about Kafka. It's like Kafka is there for us as an event queue for that. Um, so drill back on Maroon agent. So what is what is Maroon agent? What is really doing that? Uh, Maroon agent is like a nice little daemon that runs on each and every host of Slack Slack instances. So if you provision a new server in Slack. Uh, modern agent installed automatically. It's just run as a side card for you. Uh, and it listened to a Unix socket domain. So anyone wanted to write a logs, they just keep writing to the Unix socket domain and send the logs to those things. So once a Maroon agent receives a payload and it append, it wrap other metadata information that we noticed in the uh, Maroon protocol, uh, it add timestamp, it add like what is a host it is generated, it's try, it adding an incremental offset sequence number, and it add what is the type of the message uh, and the process ID. So it's add all the other metadata information and wrap in a container, uh, and then just push that one. Um, by container, I mean like modern protocol I'm using as a container um, here. Um, so that's not all enough because. The downstream is never be reliable. The downstream can always fail. Like Kafka can fail. What will happen if modern agent not able to send the data, right? Uh, and it's a very, uh, this happen all the time. So how do we, f and it's either it can run on a downgraded mode or it could be completely uh, unavailable. So that essentially create a back pressure onto the source system. So modern agents should support and observe the back pressure from whatever the upstream failures happened. So uh, Maroon Agent has a concept of uh, queuing. Uh, it supports two queues. Uh, one is like disk assistant queue. So what happened is that if it is not able to write any events to the upstream, it started to write to a disk assistant uh, queue. Uh, and once the upstream available again, it will replay from the queue. Uh, and thereby it guarantee that minimize the data loss in front of the things. Um, so that is one failure case as well, what upstream fail. And the other failure case is like, what if the Maroon agent itself fail? Um, what, if, what if the application not able to write to Maroon agent? So Maroon agent provide a managed queue. So managed queue is nothing but a wrapper. We built it around a file system. Um, so if an application not able to write to a Maroon agent, it'll just write to a managed queue. When Maroon agent available again, it'll again replay from our uh, managed queue system. So those disk assistant queue and managed queue is essentially the same concept. We build it on the same abstra abstraction. Thereby, we provide like no matter if an upstream is not available or, uh, or even the Maroon agent is not available, the application is still able to lock the events into, into our event pipeline. Um, so that's how we kind of solve uh, providing more fault tolerance uh, when the event sourcing part of it. And then those Maroon agents ship the logs to Maroon server. So Maroon server is a nice gRPC service that accept events from Maroon agent and other external clients. What I mean by other external clients is that Maroon Agents is a nice little demon, but run, can run only on the Slack instances. But Slack is available on all the mobile devices. So what if 
a mobile device not able to connect to Slack service, they still need to be able to send, hey, I'm not able to connect, and that's a critical metrics that we need to do that. Um, so Maroon Server can accept uh, metrics from other external clients if they're able to communicate to the Maroon agent side, right? Um, so Maroon agent provide much more than that. It is essentially our routing framework for us. Uh, I'll explain the routing framework uh, on the next slide. Um, and the Maroon server essentially uh, gather those information and then pass on to um, Kafka or any other event queue system that we do that, right? So, so what is, so let's take a deep dive on like Maroon server, like how this routing protocol works. Uh, when we started to develop this event pipeline, as Jackson mentioned, that what we notice is that a producer can, uh, there can be one producer can be consumed by multiple consumers and wanted to be, uh, they can in interpret those messages in a multiple way, right? You know, do you like business, let's say you take an example of Apache Access Lock. A business analytics can see Apache Access Lock in a different perspective versus the operational analytics see in a different perspective on a different transformation uh, of a thing. So we often end up multiplexing the same events across the different pools. Um, and we also notice that, let's say, business critical data, that needs to be go to be more highly secure uh, Kafka cluster versus the event log or any Apache access log. That doesn't require that level of security and like other authentication on top of it. So different logs and different types um, has a different need and inter different interpretation throughout the downstream, right? So the Maroon routing protocol essentially says, oh, this is a type of a message can goes to a secure box, secure pool, secure pool and goes to a less secure pool or high throughput pool. So you can configure a same message to be delivered to multiple destination of pools. Um, so that's essentially controlled in our routing layer. Um, and this is completely a configuration driven. Uh, we can dynamically add those configuration to change the way the flow uh, of those individual type flowing through those things. And um, this, this routing protocol comes very handy in for us whenever we do upgrade of upstream system. Let's say we do, we recently did like from Kafka 0 0.11 to Kafka 2.0, and the upgrade was seamless is because we just spin off another cluster and add another routing layer, uh, routing rule for uh, our types and just end up in the Kafka 2 clusters. Uh, and it's easy for us to uh, do migrations and upstream failures. Um, so that's about the modern routing protocol. So then, so with this modern agent and modern uh, server, we talk about a lot about infrastructure, like how the events originated and how it is getting routed. But if you drill down an event, an event has a life cycle on its own. Event get produced uh, by a producer, and then it goes to some kind of a transformation. Let's take an example of Apache Access Log. It's a simple text file, um, and then we need to, like, let's say Apache Access Log, we wanted to ingest into Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch accept JSON documents, and we need to convert that docker, like Apache Access Log, into a JSON format. So you apply some grok parsing in the middle. And, and in the event that you realize, like, most of the logs are HTTP 200, is less important or less interesting logs to index, and you wanted to drop or sample some HTTP status code 200, uh, and then ingest that. But in data warehouse perspective, you want like all the logs uh, to give full corrective analytical solutions. So the event itself goes through a different life cycle, just like how we grow. So we wanted to capture that life cycle also. So we come up with a maroon adopter. So adopter is essentially an, an adopter for um, intercept a life cycle of an event, and you can write a very generic um, extra, like a very generic life cycle event on top of it. Like um, both the data warehouse and the Elasticsearch uh, require Apache access to be in the JSON format. So there is no point of converting into converting in two different places. You can write a modern adopter that essentially convert uh, 
your Apache Access Flow JSON format, and all the other downstream consumers can reuse the same thing, right? So that's that's what the modern adopters all those about. So combining combining our modern agent, modern server, and the modern adopter patterns, uh, this is where we end up. Uh, this is our current state of a system, uh, our event pipeline. So you can see there are. Um, uh, there are set of agents sending the message to our server, and Kafka is having uh, in the as an event queue for us, and um, and we have set of consumers essentially implementing an event lifecycle for those things. So we talked about the reliability crisis that we had it earlier, and we we indeed create replay the whole event and we created what you call the reliability index score and we plotted it and you can choose a type and we can say what is the reliability index score of a particular event to give a lot of uh, to gain more confidence to our users to get more visibility on top of it and some of the things that we achieve like uh, some part of a time we achieve 100 percentage uh, of reliable event pipelines on top of this so it's all fine, like what is next? Like what are we working on now? Um, how are you going to improve the system? Uh, the number one is modern DAP. Modern, we call it like direct acyclic blueprint. It essentially says, if you take up a modern agent and modern server, talks a lot about infrastructure, and then we talked about event life cycle. Ability to write a pipeline and the infrastructure as a code is a very, very powerful feature. And that will give a power to our users without worrying about how to spin off an infrastructure, how to manage our event lifecycle. Um, they can create the pipeline on their own and manage that one. So the vision of modern DAP is to get to a stage where we give a DSL uh, to our end users to create their own uh, pipeline and infrastructure and manage by themselves. Um, that's what modern DAP about. And the, modern intelligence thing. Um, in the industry, there was a lot of, lot of talk about in the streaming world about how do we manage late arriving data, uh, you know, how do we manage watermark period and all those things. But in all practical life, what we notice that what will happen if an upstream sync is degraded mode, like not performing, Elasticsearch is slow for some time. But the application developer wanted to see the latest log. They don't want to wait for the degraded servers to be up and running again. Um, and what we really notice that a latency watermark is a biggest thing in our event pipeline. We should treat, we should have a low tolerance for violating the, lat violating the latency watermark. Uh, the modern backfill idea is that if you notice that there is a uh, events violating a latency watermark, we advance the pipeline to the current event and create an automatic backfill infrastructure to slowly consume uh, the, uh, the lag data into the system. So we promise or we, we can keep the system up and running and always up to date, and reflect the current state of our application servers, uh, not the five minutes delay um, of the systems there. So that's, that's an idea behind auto backfill. And the schema as a service, like, even though we capture a lot of semi-structured information, often it is important to describe what is the event, uh, what is a, what does the payload look like. Um, that would be very helpful to create a very generic adopters down the pipeline, can be reusable across all the uh, all the pipelines. So uh, we are working on a schema as a service on sort of things. Um, so yeah, that's about it. Um, we are planning or thinking to open source this. If any of the things or interested to you, come talk to us. We can work up that. Thank you. Hey, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, so it sounded, especially with the last slide now, like um, maybe you are thinking about taking this approach of standardizing a bit uh, different ways of streaming basically related kinds of data. Um, are you planning on taking the same approach to other parts of your data? So now this is for logging, but then also for uh, all of the other types of data that go through the system? Are you planning yes. something like that? Um, yes, that's right. Like, this event pipeline initially started for logs, but now we are, and we adopted traces now, and we are also getting into metrics now. 
So our goal is to support all three format of monitoring pillars. Uh, and then these are the important property that we wanted to give everyone to go out there. So yeah, we are extending our support to other things. Also. And, uh, as far as like uh, traces and metrics, we actually um, we ingest Prometheus metrics as a remote storage endpoint in our event pipeline, and then we've also uh, ingest traces as well. Hi, uh, Hi. thanks for for, for the talk. Uh, can, do you um, think that it's uh, uh, beneficial to upstream some of uh, like this work? Uh, for example, System D has uh, binary logs, and they could benefit from your ideas about this, like having these mandatory fields, and those, uh, so that uh, all basically Linux like instances who, who run like or something like System D would benefit from those when having like incremental IDs or something like that. So do you think it's beneficial to be maybe upstream like that format or something like that uh, to, to those like projects? I'm, I'm sorry, what is the system? System D, uh, basically uh, like uh, a Linux uh, yeah. thing. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so so um, as far as like, uh, so, uh, as we showed, like uh, Marin server can receive the events through gRPC, um, and for the most part, we don't assume that uh, when we get the gRPC events, they're going to have the offset and the um, and we expect the host names field. But like the the rest of the UUID, we don't assume that it's going to be populated. So uh, when Marin server re receives the events, if it doesn't have these fields, it will auto auto populate them. Um, but we also we also try to like encourage people that are sending the logs through gRPC to. Like, Go ahead and do that because if they set that offset uh, from uh, from their client, then that means like when we if we do lose the data, we can track it back and say, okay, here's the offset. It orig originated in your server from this point before it even reached our infrastructure. And I think the same applies for uh, System D as well. If System D did have that kind of incremental offset and sent it to to us uh, in our pipeline that way, we could. Uh, similarly, trace it back. Okay, here's where it failed in the system D pipeline. So yeah, so in short, yeah, definitely. Uh, my question would be: How do you manage uh, dynamic mapping fields regarding Elasticsearch in this case? So, it might be that in some way, there's always this problem within Elasticsearch, depending on how many fields goes inside the system. Either you have a strict mapping definition or a dynamic one. In this case, which one are you using, at least in case regarding Elasticsearch? Uh, so we use dynamic mapping in Elasticsearch, and it's definitely a pain point for us. It's something we're trying to figure out. Um, part of what we're trying to do with the schema as a service is yeah. we want to, as far as Elasticsearch ingestion, we want to say, um, you know, send us all the fields that you want, but uh, tell us which fields are important to you and which fields need the type safety. Um, and then that way we can enforce it on the Elasticsearch side. Uh, but yeah, we definitely. Right now, we're using the dynamic uh, type mapping, and it's definitely a pain point for us. Okay. Yeah. And um, regarding conflicts, um, because the thing is that depending on which service you want to represent it, so I've seen Prometheus over there, so it might be that you might be also using Grafana, but at least within service um, like within Kibana, with Canvas, has sometimes some problems regarding conflict mm -hmm. due to some um, issues with the um, map. Mapping of certain fields. Um, in this case, how do you deal with that? Uh, so right now we don't have such a um, at least because uh, we have the type field, so we index yeah. on the type field. Um, so as long as uh, generally only one application is going to send the same type of logs, like two applications shouldn't be sending the same type of log. Um, and so as long as that application uh, doesn't emit bad logs, where it's like changing the field. Uh, it's usually fine, but in cases where we do have the type field collision, we just um, drop the logs. Okay. Uh, we don't bother trying to index it into Elasticsearch because it can't really handle it. <laughs>